So hi folks, I'm gonna to talk today about some research that we've done on provider communication in the United States. I will sort of give a preface in this international context that the U.S. has a, has a clinic-based approach where you go see a primary care provider in clinic and that's where you receive vaccines. I appreciate that in many other parts of the world that have been more successful with HPV vaccination, they have relied on school-located vaccination. That does happen in the U.S., but primarily that's not how we do it. All right, so some disclosures about funding from our government sources, as well as foundations, as well as industry. So I wanna give you a bit of the overview of where we came from. So I'm gonna give some data that, since I have never talked to this group before, I'll give you a bit of the background for why we developed a communication training, what the impact of the training is, and then how we've improved it over time, and what the, what the data look like after some of those improvements. So we, uh, early on we did some interviews with, um, we, we recorded primary care visits in clinics, put a recorder down, recorded what happened, and then uh, analyzed the data. So the, the data, these uh, recordings allowed us to um, look at different styles of communication, different content. And one of the things that providers did is that they offered delay. Uh, if they offered uh, saying something like, you don't need to get the vaccine today, you can get it some other time, uh, so that would be offering delay, or they did not offer delay. Instead, they were encouraging same-day vaccination. And that's what we have on the, on the side here is same-day HPV vaccine uptake. And so if they did not offer delay, 82% of parents got HPV vaccine. And if they offered delay or recommended delay, then that only 6% got it. So that's a pretty big effect. And then similarly, uh, there was also the use of pre these presumptive announcements. Uh, the idea that you say the child's due and you treat the vaccine like any other vaccine without a lot of other discussion. So those were uh, pretty rarely used, but they were incredibly effective. So a similar story here, the providers who used a presumptive approach uh, uh, I were able to achieve much higher HPV vaccine uptake that day as opposed to a, a participatory approach uh, to raising the vaccine topic and then discussing it. So one could make a lot of assumptions about this. This is observational data, it's not intervention data. So what might intervention data tell us? That's what we'll move to next. We developed the announcement approach training on making effective HPV vaccine recommendations. Uh, it's centered on this idea of a presumptive announcement that sounds something like this. Now that Sophia is 12, she's due for three vaccines. Today she'll get vaccines to prevent meningitis, HPV cancers, and whooping cough. So that has some elements to it. There's noting the child's age, which sets up a, uh, a, a frame around the whole interaction that says everything that follows here is part of routine medical care. Then uh, there's a, a discussion of vaccines. It's not about diseases. Pardon me, it's a discussion of diseases, what, we, what I meant to say is the opposite, is that they're due for vaccines that prevent, and then you, you specifically go through the diseases, putting HPV cancers in the middle of the list uh, so that HPV is normalized and not, is not uh, held out in any particular way. And finally, say you'll vaccinate today. Uh, the nurse will give these at the end of the visit is a common way to phrase it. So we took that presumptive announcement and then we built in a whole communication approach around that announcement. We fleshed it out by uh, adding in uh, an approach to talk to hesitant parents. Now this is not as in depth as what we heard earlier about motivational interviewing in a couple different, couple different presentations. It's relatively brief. This whole approach is designed to happen in a few minutes. So then we took this, uh, this approach um, and I, I, there, there's some s details here which I'll go through in a second. But we took this whole approach here and then we wrapped it into a training so we could train providers on how to use this communication approach. And okay, so the, um, the, this part of addressing parent hesitancy, the connect piece is you ask parent for their, parents for their main concern. No matter what came up that, that paused the conversation, you ask them, what's your main concern? And then you show parents that you're listening. You give, either you can use the mirroring approach that we heard about before. There's a few other approaches that one can use. Then you counsel them. And you tell them to use a, re, uh, you help them, uh, the provider use a research tested message. So we develop various, uh, various messages that the providers can use uh, by testing them with parents, a uh, national probability sample of parents. We have them uh, give a reason to vaccinate. So you say, here's the answer to your concerns. I've addressed them. Uh, you should vaccinate because giving a reason is a way of motivating people. It doesn't even matter if it's a good or a bad reason, but people are more likely to agree to request if you, get, if you give them a reason. And then you, again, return to this issue of vaccinating today. So the training that we developed uh, is a one-hour training. It's physician-led, it's in clinic, and we provide continuing medical education credits to the providers who attend. 
uh, it has four pieces. One is we go over the evidence of what we know about HPV vaccination, how it works, what the consequences are. Uh, we build skills. We have them learn this communication approach uh, didactically, and then we have them practice it with each other. And then finally, in the last piece, this next steps piece, we talk about how they will uh, do this in their clinic. How will this work as part of clinic flow? How do they involve nurses? How do they involve medical assistants? How do they involve nurse practitioners and so on? So here's the impact of the training that we did. We did this in, uh, in 30 clinics in North Carolina. Uh, the, the data that I'm presenting here are for 17,000 adolescents ages 11 and 12. In the U.S., that's the target vaccination age according to national recommendations for HPV vaccination for boys and girls. A um, few things, there are three arms in this trial. I'm only going to show two bars here, and the reason is that I've taken the change, the increase in vaccination in the control arm, and I've subtracted it from the change in the other arm. So this is the change of changes approach, if you will. And there's the announcement approach training arm, the control arm, but there's a third arm where we had a conversational approach that we trained folks in. And in that conversational approach, it's, uh, it starts off with a full-on conversation. There are these vaccines, here's some of the benefits, uh, here's some of the other things, uh, and it goes through all of it in quite a bit of detail. And then they move on to all the rest being the same, where there's the same counseling approach of um, addressing the concerns, showing that you're listening, uh, and so on. Okay, so I guess I should uh, say here that the, the main finding is that for the announcement approach training, a statistically significant increase of 5% using clinic verified uh, records on vaccination doses. Uh, for, the, for the conversational approach, there's no change in vaccination. There's no increase that's statistically significant. That gray bar down here has uh, is essentially no change at all. Uh, they have, the intervention was equally effective for females as well as for male children. So the, uh, the, the recommendation approach works. That was good news. Uh, it increased vaccination, but it also reduced the amount of time to, um, to discuss all of this with parents. So it took less time, it increased vaccination, uh, and indeed, the National Cancer Institute has adopted this as an evidence-based practice. So they now list it on their website of, of um, re research tested interventions. The CDC, uh, the, the U US CDC, and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend using presumptive announcements as a way to open the topic of, vac of HPV vaccination with adolescents uh, and their families. So we've then since updated our materials, and that's what most of the new data are that I'm going to talk about today. So we revised the materials to reflect new evidence on effectiveness. We've moved from having, <coughs> we used to have just F data on, on um, <coughs> genital warts, and now we have impact data on precancers, and increasingly there's even data that's starting to be convincing on cancers. Uh, we improved usability and memorability. You've heard people here on, up on the stage a couple times talking about their acronyms and forgetting what one of the acronyms was. So we found that we were doing the same. Uh, that we used to have this ease approach to addressing parent concerns, and I could never remember in my talks. Once I got sort of toward the end, it was something about evidence I couldn't quite remember. So we wanted to make it simpler for the providers to remember. And then we <coughs> did this extensive national testing of these uh, brief research tested messages to address parent hesitancy. These are uh, some of the examples of the messages um, that the seven that tested best for each of the topics. You know, if someone says, uh, if they're concerned about sex, you can say this really isn't about sex. The HPV vaccine is about preventing cancer. One of the interesting things that we found is that uh, providers need something short and relatively low readability, um, meaning low grade level readability in order to be able to remember this stuff. But parents actually want something a little longer. So if you're going to have a conversation about uh, to address a concern, it can't use anything as short as this. It has to take these as a point of departure and then elaborate on them as providers actually do tend to do. All right, another thing we did is we added a video of a woman who had an experience with cervical cancer, and this is Lisa Moore. So I'm going to play this for you. It's very brief. It's one minute. My name is Lisa Moore. I'm 30 years old, and I live in South Bend, Indiana, and I was diagnosed with stage 1B1 adenocarcinoma of the cervix at 26. No one deserves this. Bowel obstructions are not fun. Neff tubes are not fun. Tubes in your stomach aren't fun. The side effects of the treatment are not fun. If something like this is preventable, I don't understand why people don't want to prevent it. If it was a leukemia vaccine or breast cancer or prostate cancer or anything not related to sex, there'd be no question. Cancer sucks. It takes and takes and takes. And majority of the time, it takes everything and kills you. 
if I can help somebody else not go through this. That's probably the best thing I have to offer at this point. Yeah, so it's a heavy video, and I'm sorry to lay that on your afternoon or your morning. Um, so Lisa asked that her story be shared. She really wanted to be an advocate for HPV vaccination, and indeed, I think she's a very powerful advocate. I get a bit emotional every time I see this. I think it's a very, very powerful um, way to get people focused on this issue and to care about HPV cancers in a way that pedi pediatricians and other primary care professionals might not because they don't tend to see the cancers. So we did trainings. Uh, we did 10 of them uh, in uh, middle of 2018. Uh, the middle of the year in the U.S. really matters because that's when there's a peak in vaccination, adolescent vaccination across all states. All states have a, have a peak. It's driven by the policies that require Tdap and meningitis. T almost all states require Tdap vaccination and then a little more than half require meningitis vaccination. And that brings HPV vaccine along with a summer peak because kids go in before school uh, because there's a requirement for school entry and then they, um, they get these other vaccines. Uh, so we recruited the sites for the sites, meaning the clinical sites, in two ways. One is we worked with our, uh, our, pediatric, our state pediatric chapters. We also worked with the American Cancer Society with some of their staff. Uh, we trained 10 physician educators, and I call them study or local. So the study were the couple of folks that were part of our UNC research team. They were physicians that we employed directly. But we also did a train the trainer approach where we, we tried to uh, train people either in organizations, uh, in other organizations, or train people across the country. We had about 300 attendees who were a mix of everything from physicians all the way down to medical students. Uh, these are where the trainings happened. They were all across the U.S. Uh, at this point, I guess I should also mention we've done, I, I've lost track of the number of trainings we've done, but we've, had a, we've trained a, a little over a thousand providers. So here's the impact of the training. So we don't have vaccination data to give you, but I, what I'm going to give you is what we think are the things that should change in order to increase uh, vaccine recommendations. So among the, uh, among the attendees, these are data for about 240 attendees. We, uh, uh, there was a problem with about 50 of the surveys because um, some very eager people just took the surveys and the pre and post and just separated them. So uh, we can't give you all the data. Uh, so the first thing is norms. Most parents think HPV vaccination is important for 11 to 12-year-olds. That increased in a statistically significant way, uh, and also I think in a play, you know, to an extent that's clinically meaningful. Same thing with self-efficacy, their confidence in addressing parents' concerns about HPV vaccination, that also increased. And then finally, intentions. I plan to routinely recommend HPV vaccine when patients turn 11 or 12. That also increased, although to a smaller amount, in part because it was already relatively high in this sample. Now, the one slightly quirky finding is about attitudes. Talking with parents will take too long. Talking with parents of HPV vaccination will take too long. And that also increased. That was not what we were hoping for. Uh, it's all relatively low on the scale, so it's not even, even past the mis midpoints, so and most people are still disagreeing. Uh, what we think is this is a, an artifact of measurement that people were generally, uh, generally sort of ticking on one end of the scale, and so there were some misunderstandings about, um, about how to use the survey. So we've done some more research since, then, since this time fixing this item, and indeed it goes the direction that you would expect it to with relatively high ratings and also showing increases. So in terms of the uh, impact of the uh, training, it was equally effective in, across different populations. So for physicians, nurses, and medical students, it worked just as well. Uh, it was also equally effective depending on who was leading it, either the UNC folks who we worked with pretty closely uh, as opposed to the, as compared to the folks who we did the train the trainer where it was a, an online real-time uh, real interactive two-hour training, uh, but much less supervision, much, le much less interaction. The one exception is that uh, the folks who are not UNC-led, they sort of train the trainer folks, uh, they did, that group, the Trainings led by that group did not show an increase in intentions, and that's because they started out so high. They started, uh, that, those clinics started out with mean intentions of 4.52, which is, uh, you know, you can't really go much up from there. So it appears that they recruited places that were easier, uh, that already had um, a lot of strengths and maybe didn't need the training as much. Uh, in terms of implementation outcomes, uh, this is uh, moving back to participants again. I'm satisfied with uh, the announcement approach, training the physician educator. It's pretty much all above 90%. I'm going to show you a, a, some, more, uh, some more of these, and they're all really high. Feasibility, adoption, uh, the training did really well on that, and it's always been that way. All the different versions of the training have always scored really highly with participants. 
in terms of the orientation of the people who are delivering the trainer, this is the train the trainer piece for our, tra our 10 physician educators, they said that it increased their knowledge, uh, it made them excited to, le to lead the trainings and prepared them to answer peers' questions. Uh, they also said it was a training they would recommend to others. So it was routinely very well reviewed and that we, it continues to get uh, good reviews. Uh, so over 90% of folks who attended the announcement approach trainings um, intended to use this approach in the future. Uh, it was equally effective when held, uh, led by local and physician educators, although we suspect uh, there's a need in all cases to go to clinics where they have challenges as opposed to just going to places that are open to being intervened with. In terms of future work that we'd like to do, uh, we're interested in trying to identify roles for the full primary care team in our training. So currently the role of nurses is not well defined and we, d we plan to, train, uh, to change that. We're also interested in how parents perceive the announcement approach. It appears that these are, these are things are going well, but I was particularly uh, fond of Arnaud's uh, uh, presentation where he actually, and I'm a little bit jealous, uh, he has the data on parents' responses because we always get those questions. Uh, and of course, there's also the question of usefulness with hesitant parents. We don't know. We know what it does at a population level, but we, we, don't, we didn't have that kind of fine-grained data because of, the, uh, because of our data sources. So we have disseminated our intervention uh, materials, the updated materials through hpviq.org. So they're all available for free online. Uh, this is a website that we maintain that shares these materials, uh, includes these communication training tools, how to um, get people trained up, uh, and then uh, how to exactly to go through all of the different pieces of the presentation, as well as all the specific materials, everything from there's a, a training script, a standardized training uh, script that is used to present this, there's slides and so on. So this is a fully manualized training. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll be continuing to do this uh, over the next several years. We already have tra trainings planned for next year. We're moving to a train the trainer approach where we train QI and physicians within organizations and then they take it from there. So we've uh, done that successfully with uh, a large healthcare system in Iowa and now we're negotiating with uh, several large healthcare systems in California to help spread this work. So thank you very much.